Sure. Okay. And I think in this instructions, you might need to remind anybody watching online that they can't vote. Yeah. But also, um, there's a little tip here. Um, if you might have missed the agenda back there, maybe. Okay. <clears throat> Do I vote? Um, I don't know, actually. I have no idea. It like Robert's rules thing. I think that the chair does vote. In fact... It seems right to me. Yeah. I think Karen's here to ask you a question. She's, okay. She's making the amendment to the report. Sounds good. Oh, I'll look for you there. I think it would sign the um, Declaration of Church Membership. Yeah, you can start. I'm going to call this meeting to order. <coughs> Up speed. If you would kindly take your seats, I'll call Elaine Pinto forward to open with prayer. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Holy One, in this annual meeting we give you thanks for all that we have heard of the labor and the joy of working in this parish over the past year. We thank you for all who participated in the governance and the ministry at St. Margaret's. Help us to keep central in our minds that it is you who were the first to look upon us, to call us, and to give us gifts for each other and for the world. And help us to remember that it is from what you have given us that we can return gifts to you who loved us first and ever draw us into the way of your kingdom. So we pray now for wisdom that we might care well for this parish in this city for such a time as this. We pray we would love and respect those who think and act differently than we do. We pray you would help us discern your heart and your ways, that we might see your face, and so find our hands strengthened to do your will. In the name of the Father who created us, the Son who has redeemed us, and the Holy Spirit who leads us. Amen. We begin by acknowledging that the parish of St. Margaret lies in Treaty 1 territory, which we recognize as the Métis homeland, the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota. It's my pleasure this afternoon to appoint Clint Curl to be the chair of this meeting and Jana Neufeld to be the secretary. So good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, I'll begin by uh, a few announcements, and then we'll get to the order of business. First of all, uh, agendas and other assorted essential documents are available at the back of the church on a table. So if you don't have an agenda, um, that's where they're located. Um, it will be necessary in order to vote to sign the Declaration of Church Membership. So uh, to do that, you're a member. If you are here, you're a recognized attendant at St. Margaret's today, <laughs> over 16 years of age. And by signing the Declaration of Membership, you're able to vote. They are located on four clipboards, on four music stands at the back. If you haven't done it yet, you'll have opportunity at the break because we'll be doing voting in the... Uh, I believe? No, we may do it right now. Yeah, let's do it right now. No, we will be voting before the break. So uh, if you haven't yet signed the Declaration of Church Membership, they are at the back. While we're voting for folks to uh, sign the Declaration of Church Membership, I should say that we do have some folks joining by remote through YouTube. This year, we welcome you uh, via YouTube, but we do not have capacity to register a vote for those joining by remote, nor to entertain questions. Um, just as a point of uh, uh, parliamentary procedure, when you move or second a motion, uh, please identify yourself by first and last name. And that's going to be making it very easy for uh, our Secretary Jana to keep track of the meeting. Finally, last of the announcements, it's good form to start a business meeting with a joke. So here's a cute story. Uh, my grandfather, of blessed memory, was 90th birthday. I asked him, Grandpa, in all your long years, what's the greatest invention you've ever seen? Right? And I thought he would say something like combine or satellite or computer, but no. He thought a bit, pondered, and then he looks at me and he says, the thermos. I said, the thermos? How do you figure that? And he replied, well, you think about it. You pour something hot into a thermos, it keeps it hot. You pour something cold into a thermos, it keeps it cold. How does it know? <laughs> so you can see the intelligent high-class roots I come from. <laughs> You're trusting me to chair this meeting. All right, let's begin. Um, the agenda is before you. I would welcome a motion to approve the agenda as printed. Do I have a motion? Uh, I see. Uh, is it? Joy. Joy, Joy Odo. Uh, second? Okay, Heather. Heather's there. Uh, all, I guess we could open up for debate. Any changes, additions, deletions to the agenda? Not seeing any. All in favor of approving the agenda as printed, please raise your hand. All opposed? The yeas have it carried. Call for new business. We do have a protocol for bringing new business to the floor. What I would like you to do, if you have an item of new business you would like uh, this August body to address, please write it out and bring it to me during the break and we will have time to review it and then address it in section four of our agenda before closing. <clears throat> okay, so you have new business, write it out, bring it to me at the break. Okay, let's go on to the minutes. Uh, the minutes of the 2003 annual general meeting of St. Margaret's Church uh, have been distributed. They are at the back, you want to have a copy. Um, can I have a motion to approve the 2023 minutes as distributed? I see Larry Reynolds. Second? Pardon me? Okay, great. We have a second. Uh, any errors, changes, revisions to those minutes of 2023? Go 
Going once, going twice, going three times. All in favor of approving the 2023 minutes, please raise your hand. All opposed? The yeas have it carried. Is there any business now arising from the 2023 minutes? Not seeing any, we will proceed. I now uh, offer the floor to uh, Reverend Bonnie Dowling to share her opening remarks. My opening remarks this year are not very long. It's not because of a certain football game that I understand is on sometime today. Uh, and I make no promises about future years. My opening remarks this year aren't very long because I have been thinking about them, as I have been thinking about them and preparing for this meeting over the last several weeks. One thing keeps returning to me and it won't take me very long to say. It is just this. You are incredible. You are incredible. You are doing this, all of this, Every single one of the reports prepared for this meeting is a description of your faithfulness and generosity, not only in giving financial gifts, but giving in all those other intangible ways, your wisdom, your dedication, your passion and creativity. You are building a church that is truly a community gathered by grace. You are developing a new generation of Christian leaders for the world and in so doing, you are making a bold proclamation of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Earlier this week, I was asked to speak at a conference at CMU, a conference for pastors on the question of hope. I was asked, I believe, because I happen to be the rector of this parish. As I prepared, I only saw more and more clearly that my real privilege and honor was to represent this congregation to that conference. I only told them of what I have learned from you, what I have learned from working with so many of you and walking alongside you. I simply told them what I have learned by watching this congregation work to realize one another's vocations, unleashing so many diverse gifts for ministry with a view to achieving the vision of the whole. And I described what I have learned by watching this community ensure that the institutional life of this church is as formed by grace, by the grace of God, as is its worship. I told them what I have learned in watching and listening to the vestries and executives and annual general meetings of this parish press for and discern new ways to pursue the movement of the Holy Spirit in our midst and in the world around us. I told them what I have seen of Christ's work in and through you, that through you here, Christ is setting others free. And I can think of no better, no stronger, no more compelling sign of hope in the world. Now, of course, none of the reports prepared for this meeting mean that we have arrived. It doesn't mean there are no new ministries to fund or new gifts to discover and unleash. The New Testament describes a church that is always growing, necessarily growing, because its basic identity is a people with good news to share, people of the gospel that sets others free and transforms us all with love. Thus, there will never be a day when all the work will be done. There will never be a day when we will not be looking for everyone who is looking for us. But today, this day, I hope you will simply join me in giving thanks that the same Spirit is working in us who has filled his church since its birth. Let us give thanks this day that the same Spirit is at work here who knit together those Christians described in Acts chapter 2 and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And day by day, 
attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It is the greatest privilege of my life to serve a congregation so full of committed and thoughtful Christian leaders. The question in my mind is what else do you want to do in this place together? Thank you very much, Bonnie, for uh, your opening remarks. They were well and warmly received, and in the minutes they were received for information. Uh, we now turn to the uh, matter of the offices of the church, uh, and we will first begin with appointments. So I would invite Bonnie again to take the floor and present the 2024 appointments uh, for uh, those offices. Okay. Appointed as Rector's Warden is Val Newfeld. Appointed as Deputy Rector's Warden is Will Rue. Appointed as Envelope Secretary is Kristen McLean. Appointed as Treasurer is Stu Taylor. And appointed as Assistant Treasurer is Ali Vito. Thank you, Bonnie, for reading those appointments. Uh, I would l entertain a motion uh, to make the deputies who were just read ex officio members of Vestry. Would Thank you, Tony. Is there a second? Ryan Turnbull. Ryan Turnbull is a second. Any debate on that motion to make the deputies ex officio members of Vestry? Seeing no debate, all in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Carried. Great. We now turn to the very exciting matter of elected offices. Uh, first order of business under that category would be uh, to uh, establish some scrutineers for the ballots. I would entertain a motion to appoint Lowell Friesen and Heather Epp to act as scrutineers. Would anyone like to make that motion? Heather, making the motion. Is there a seconder? Uh, okay, Elaine, I saw. It's like an auction. I see that hand. I see that hand. Um, okay, uh, so any debate on that of uh, Lowell Friesen and Heather Epp as scrutineers? Seeing no debate, we'll bring it to a, a uh, floor vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, it is carried. Uh, we'd also like to make a motion, I will entertain this motion, that the results of the election of People's Warden Deputies, People's Warden Vestry, and Synod Delegates be destroyed following the meeting. This is standard procedure, though it sounds pretty dramatic. <laughs> Would anyone like to make a motion that we will uh, be destroying the, the ballots after the meeting? Anyone dare to make that motion? Oh, I see. Uh, it's Will Rue. Okay. Any seconders? Someone to second? Uh, Stu. I saw Stu. I'm sorry. You're right in line. <laughs> Stu got it first. Uh, any debate on that? Seeing none. All in favor of wrecking ballots? Please raise your hands. Any opposed? Okay. The yeas have it carried. Uh, at this point, I would like to invite the nominating committee to take the floor and present their nominations for, I believe we'll start with People's Warden and Deputy. Now, I would like to make a, uh, just a point of uh, process. Um, it is not possible under Robert's rules for the nominating chair to nominate themselves. So we are going to ask another member of the nominating committee to do that job. And I see Nathan Rempel's already there. So in case you're wondering why there's two people there, that's why. Please proceed, nominating committee. The nomination for People's Warden is Stephen Cremusa. Uh, and the nomination for Deputy People's Warden is Kelly Milne. 
<laughs> All right, we have those two nominations. Now, are there any further nominations for People's Warden or Deputy People's Warden from the floor? You need to make this a formal uh, nomination. That's my first time of asking. I'll ask it again. Are there any further nominations for People's Warden or Deputy People's Warden? I will ask it a third time. Are there any further nominations for People's Warden or Deputy People's Warden? Seeing none, the nominations are closed. Given that there are only two nominations for two spots, two offices, I hereby declare that Stephen Kremusa is elected as People's Warden and Kelly Melm is elected as Deputy People's Warden. There's no need for ballot. We now turn to uh, the next order of election, which is, I believe, members of Vestry. I'd like to ask the nominations chair to present nominations for Vestry. Okay, the nominations for Vestry are as follows. Chris Banman, John Brubaker, Harold Dick, Nathan Duick, Joanne Epp, Sabina Fazaludin, Amy Knight, Johanna Hanford, Caleb Olfert, Eric Parsons, Rebecca Whittacombe, Ryan Weeb, and Kira Rowett. All right, we thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, are there any further nominations for members of vestry from the floor? We, uh, according to the canons of the church, we may have up to 20. So we do have room if anyone really wanted to nominate somebody. That's my first time of asking. I'll ask it again. Are there any further nominations for members of vestry? I'll ask it a third time. Are there any nominations for members of vestry? Seeing none, the nominations are closed. I hereby declare that the slate of nominees as presented be elected as members of Vestry. We now turn to Synod Delegates. Uh, Stephen, would you like to present the list of nominees for Synod Delegates? Okay, the following people have been nominated for Synod Delegates. Uh, Tracy Curl, Paul Dick, Colton Kovo, Sabina Fazaludin, Caleb Olfert, Nathan Rempel, Jana Neufeld, and Pam Friesen. Thank you. Are there any further nominations for Synod Delegates? Uh, and just to say, if, if you want someone as Synod Delegate, you would have to formally nominate them from the floor. You can't just add their name to the ballot. This has to be a formal nomination. It's my first time of asking. Any further nominations for Synod Delegate candidates? My third time of asking, are there any nominations uh, for Synod uh, 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 Synod Delegate candidates. All right, seeing none, the nominations are closed. Uh, yes? Correct. Uh, we are allowed four Synod Delegates, uh, so we will have to go to ballot. Um, we will be electing four Synod delegates and then four alternates as well. Uh, the four people with the greatest number of votes will act as Synod delegates. The next four people in ascending order of votes will act as alternates if those delegates are unable to attend. It is not compulsory to vote for four names. Uh, you can vote for up to four names, correct? Correct, okay. And the scrutineers will tally the votes from greatest to least. Uh, we can now maybe distribute the ballots. And uh, so that can happen right now if we get the ballots distributed. Um, the, the names written on the ballots, you will mark an X for on up to four of them. Uh, 
Uh, Heather, question. Is it a synod? Yes, it is. Yes, it is a synod year. Yes. No, I need to tell them. Yeah. You should. Yeah. Okay. Uh, while we are balloting, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Reverend Bonnie to take the floor to give an expression of thanks. Uh, normally, our expressions of thanks are for those who are leaving an office and a uh, governance role in the parish. So, somebody leaving vestry or um, leaving our synod delegates pool. Um, or the executive, and this year we actually have nobody who's outgoing. So thank you to everyone who has served, and thank you to everyone who will continue to serve in these roles. We are grateful for your leadership and for your vision in this place. All right, has everyone finished the, their balloting? Anyone still need a bit more time? Don't see any hands, so I think the scrutineers may proceed to go do a tally uh, of the vote that will be presented after the break. So now it's time to turn to uh, our budget uh, presentation um, of the 2024 budget by Caleb Olford and Graham McFarlane. And just a word of explanation before they uh, begin. Um, so this, this presentation is gonna be for information. Uh, of course, questions will be allowed at this point, but only questions of clarification. We will have a substantive debate on the budget when a motion uh, to approve the budget is brought forward, and that will be after the break. So this is a presentation for information. You may feel free to ask clarifying questions, but please hold a substantive debate 
uh, until the uh, budget is properly brought forward by motion for approval after the break. Uh, and with that, I would pass the floor on to uh, Caleb and Graham to present the 2024 budget for information. Hi everyone, my name is Caleb Olfert. So before Graham and I get into the details of the budget and the estimate of giving for this year, we have some context and background about the process that we went through. Um, but even before that preamble, I really want to express our gratitude to everyone who was involved with the budgeting process this year. There was a number of late evenings on Zoom, looking at church financials and meeting with ministry leaders all in order to present and prepare what we're going to be looking at today. So thank you very much to Chris Bandman, to Joanna Hanford, Heather Milne, Stephen Kremusa, and Ali Vidal. All your efforts are really appreciated in putting this together. Okay, so now for the preamble. So the objective of the budget committee is to develop and propose a budget that considers the estimated amount of giving for the coming year prepared by the stewardship committee as well as the budget requests for ministry leaders as they plan ahead for the coming year. So looking for some inspiration for how to do this for 2024, naturally we look back at the last couple of years. To my horror, what I found was something resembling a dystopian future novel. One where a global virus kept people in their homes, away from family and friends and neighbors, and the whole process of planning ahead for a budget felt a lot more like a shot in the dark with contingency and caution. Then, of course, we realized that this was not the past, or the, not the future, and it was definitely not fictional. At the time, the budget committee, and I think all of us, were considering questions like, who knows when or how this is gonna end? And what does St. Margaret's, never mind the rest of the world, look like afterwards? Uh, this attitude was definitely the case for the Budget Committee in 2022. And even last year, in 2023, while things had been improving, our modestly optimistic budget was framed as an intentional move against the caution and the anxiety of the pandemic that could still be felt around us. Are we really through it, we asked? Will people come back to church? Maybe just to be safe, we should really just pare things down just in case. Last year's budget, while aware of that reality, actually said no. It's exactly when the world feels unstable that the church needs to step it up. Now this assertion did come with some implications, which is what I'll let Graham speak to. Okay, I just want to explain a little bit of how we arrived at our budget for this year by explaining how it relates to the budgets for the previous two years. So you will recall that we got government subsidies during the pandemic, and fairly substantial subsidies, largely thanks to the brilliance of Ali Vidal knowing how to navigate all of the applications. We got sort of tens of thousands of dollars in government subsidies, and we did not put that money into GICs, we didn't sit on it, uh, we spent it. We spent it on ministry, we used it to expand what we were doing, we started new initiatives, we brought new people on. So then that meant that when those government subsidies started to dry up, which was basically last year, so the two years ago we had $15,000 still from the government, then last year, none. So congregational giving went up, but it went up less than the drop-off in the government subsidies, if you see. So the so congregational giving went up by, I think it was $7,000, but that still meant that we needed to, an overall drop in the budget of about seven or $8,000 from the previous year. So, and then last year, in addition to having to have a smaller budget than the previous year, we also had inflation running at something like 10%. And so the, um, that goes for both program budgets and salaries that the actual purchasing power of every dollar is being eroded. And so the budget committee last year was facing a really difficult set of decisions, having to actually cut programming areas and not give cost of uh, living increases to the staff, which is eroding the purchasing power of their salaries. 
So that was a tough budget year to be a part of last year, 2023. And the options that the committee faced at that time was do we actually um, eliminate a position? Do we um, get rid of one of the programs that we're running? Do we actually make some really substantive cut? And uh, what the committee decided, or do we actually just present a budget that's sort of $70,000 bigger than the estimate of giving for the year? And the budget committee last year decided to do neither of those options. Uh, we just tried to kind of we, one of the reasons was we thought that the congregational giving was going up and that if we could just sort of hold tight for a year that actually the congregational giving would uh, in 2024 likely allow us to, um, to sort of reestablish the programming areas that were cut in 2023. So, so the committee last year in 2023 cut a couple of programming areas really substantially, like community development, it like cut by two thirds. And, and, and it gave a very, very modest cost of living increase to the staff. And the budget committee made a kind of mental note to itself in 2023, if congregational giving give, goes up in 2024, these are the first, we, we're not gonna take this as our new baseline, this is the first two things that we're gonna do is we're gonna restore those programming areas and we're gonna give a bigger cost of living increase to the staff, the one that they were hoping to give in 2023. And so, uh, so if congregational giving went up in 2024, the, it was already sort of predetermined where most of that money would end up going based on the decision making in 2023. Congregational giving in 2023 actually outstripped the estimate by a substantial amount. And so actually we were able to restore some of the program budgets even in 2023. But in 2024, those program budgets like community development are, are going back to what they had been before we had cut them in 2023. And, uh, and the cost of living increases that they had wanted to give in 2023, they were actually able to give in 2024 because of the rise in the estimate of giving. So anyway, that is the sort of, that's how this budget was, relates to last year's budget. Okay. Okay, so now to the, uh, the ministry leaders. So what was interesting this year was that this language of caution that we saw in the last two years uh, budget presentations did not arise at all when we were talking with the ministry leaders this year. As we met with them, their visioning seems to have refreshingly forgotten the caution that had been imposed on them over the past couple of years. So now before we get into the sheets and the numbers, um, and the estimate of giving and the, the budget, we really want to illustrate these potentially competing priorities of the budget this year. The first one is delivering on those needs for the staff missioners, salaries to keep pace with the spike in the cost of living. And the second one is providing the resources to the ministry leaders who are just ready to hit the ground running after a couple of years of reduced budgets. So while presenting a spreadsheet may feel impersonal, what we want to focus the presentation on is what we together hope to accomplish this year. These are not just numbers. They correlate to enacted ministries of the church. On Consecration Sunday, the stewardship asks us to consider, what is God calling you to give? And in turn, through the budgeting process, the stewardship committee asks the ministry leaders what is God calling us to do with those gifts? The budget committee begins by receiving the estimate of income from the stewardship committee. The estimate considers pledge cards from Consecration Sunday, pre-authorized giving and additional income based on the previous year. In the past, the budget committee, with input from Bestry, makes a decision to set a budget that is up to $10,000 above or below that estimate of income. Um, and really what this is, is an intuition or a gut feel on how optimistic or cautious the budget committee and vestry feel about the coming year. From there, the budget committee works with ministry leaders to allocate the gifts that we believe we are going to receive from the congregation and turn those dollars into ministry. 
Uh, this year, as you can see on this table in the bottom line, total estimate of income, uh, compared to the last couple of years, there has been a significant increase. And that really is because of the growing number of total donors. You see it go from 167 to 184 over the past couple of years, uh, and the amount that people have been pledging. This is really an encouraging reflection in that overall number and the commitment made by the congregation on Consecration Sunday. So uh, I think that's all I'll talk about on this slide. The total number at the bottom has gone up significantly since last year, and that total donor, the total donors in estimate from 167 to 184. Oh, good idea. So for reference, uh, in 2023, the total estimate of income was $533,000. And this year, the total estimate of income is $585,000. So just over $50,000 more than last year. Yeah, good question. So the first line is that's the cards that we received on Consecration Sunday. And then some people are signed up for automated giving with their bank. So a review is done to see which people did not make a Consecration Sunday pledge, but have been making regular monthly donations. So together, those two come up to the total donors in the estimate. Any other questions while we're here? You would just be counted once in that first row. Yeah. So here's the summary of the proposed budget for this coming year, and we'll take some time to talk through each of these ministry areas. So this year, the committee decided to set a budget that was almost exactly aligned with that estimate of income, just $2,000 over rather than 10,000 that we've gone up to in the past. This may seem to mean that the committee has remained neutral when it comes to its stance on optimism versus caution for the coming year, but really that's not quite how we see it. <clears throat> An approach that the budget committee kept this year was introduced during the COVID times, was asking ministry leaders for a range in what they would expect to need over the coming year rather than just a single number. At the low end, this would represent basically what it just needs to keep the light on, lights on just to be in survival mode. At the other end, this would represent the resources it would take to deliver the full vision of that ministry leader. The encouraging story of the budget committee's work this year, and largely because of the large increase in the estimate of giving, is that in many cases we were able to allocate budget that would give ministry leaders the opportunity to act on several of their wish list items, or at least very close to it for the coming year. So while the estimate of income and the proposed budget are nearly matched, without that further $10,000 added, the budget committee and vestry feel that this is in fact an optimistic and hopeful budget, one that is sustainable as it relates to our staff commissioners and is in step with the commitment of the church and the vision of its leaders. Uh, one technical point I'll point to here is that on the staff missioners line item, that is for all staff that are more than half time. For the other um, staff members who are less than half time, uh, their salaries are included in the ministry that, they, uh, that they're part of. And really that's in recognition that the programming is part of it, but it's also very much so the leaders that, that run them. Okay, now we're still going through each of the ministry areas and I'll go to Graham for adult Christian information. Okay, so all of the budget numbers are also printed inside the reports booklet, the um, 2023 reports booklet. And um, so it's about, it's just a little less than halfway through it. And, oh, and it's also on the, right, it's also in the agenda. Um, okay, so I'm talking about adult Christian formation, and that was 17,400 last year, and it's going to 18,500 this year. So it's just, it's a modest increase of $1,100. Um, this 
is an area that this church has put a lot of effort into over decades and that so there's already lots of programming up and running there's Thursday night lectures and there's the Slater McGuire lectures and there's the Lenten small groups and so forth and uh, this is also an area that we just we're trying to be aware that the composition of the congregation actually changes over time and we don't want to rest on our laurels on this particular one so we are interested in new possibilities and initiatives and your ideas on, on, the, on the question of adult Christian formation, we are interested in, uh, in where this ministry area ought to go. Um, at the moment, because Kurt Armstrong is on leave, it is Don Betts who's holding this file uh, for the time being. Um, but it has been an area of strength and um, the, and um, it, 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 we're not, it's not a, there's not a big change uh, in this area because there isn't a major new initiative planned yet. Um, but we would like to hear your ideas for where this ought to be going. Okay, you'll see that there is, in 2024, there is a decent increase in the children and youth Christian formation line item, about $8,000. So I looked at last year's budget presentation, which noted the following for children and youth. This year, Tracy and her team's desire is to grow this ministry and to deepen the Christian formation of the youngest members of the parish. Well, it seems to have been working. I think if last year's goal was to grow, that this year's goal is just to keep up with the new babies, the kids, and the youth that keep on seeming to show up here. Since 2022, we have seen growth in the number of children, youth, and nursery kids across all ages. And really, this budget is committed to keep doing what's been working, just for more people. At a high level, this includes snacks, regular weekday and evening events, leader training and honorariums, teaching materials, and allowance for a handful of larger off-site events throughout the year. This is one of those ministries where those of us who are upstairs on a Sunday morning do not always have direct eyes on. And you might think to yourself, how much should we really be spending on snacks? <laughs> but really, Tracy and her team of really great leaders like Ava, Colton, Sarah, Sadie, and others are making a direct investment in the connections between the youth and adult leaders and are part of that, that transition as kids graduate from high school. Okay, next is pastoral care. So the overall number last year was 13.3, and this year is 17.3. So it's a $4,000 increase, and that is the biggest proportional increase to any ministry area. So this is a good news story. This is one that is fun to talk about because this means that by hiring Holly to Holly Gosen to run pastoral care, to coordinate the various things that are already happening and to start new things and to work with congregational ideas for new things, that means that new things are actually happening and they need funding. And so this represents the caregiving uh, groups, the grief groups, um, so, and more money for the prayer shawl ministry. So we're continuing all the things that we have done in pastoral care, and there are new things happening as well, and that is because, uh, because Holly is in that position and is making things happen, and is talking to people, and they're saying, have we done this? And then Holly says, do you have any energy for that? And then the person says, I might actually have some energy for that. So then we say, we'll find the money for it. So that is what is happening in this ministry area, and it is really exciting to watch that happen. The, the sort of vision for pastoral care in this parish is setting people free for ministry, and that increase of $4,000 represents exactly that occurring right now. Okay, so there's no change uh, in budget compared to last year for governance and infrastructure. And for definitions, this includes things like printing costs, IT systems, synod fees, heating bill, and a few other things like that. So I don't want to go as far as to say that this is the boring ministry area, but it is an area of ministry that provides that institutional structure that allows for the movement and the growth of each of the other ministry areas to happen. So I'll leave it at that for, for that one. 
For worship, uh, we remain committed to the principle of the priority of worship. Worship is our most profound act of evangelism, and it reaches outwards. It's the place where the life of the parish begins and returns to. For many, it's worship, whether it's a Sunday morning service, Good Friday liturgy, or the children's Advent pageant, that will bring many people one day to walk through the doors of this building and to hope to discover the place that they've been looking for. One of the ways that we communicate this priority is by a continual pursuit of excellence in worship. While the overall number for this ministry goes down by a couple thousand dollars, there is actually an increase in the overall programming for this year. And this is due because last year being a higher budgeted line item due to some maintenance that happened on the organ that just doesn't need to be carried for this year. New plans for the worship ministry for the coming year include having a couple of dedicated uh, off-site events for the choir rehearsals and some improvements to the choir office work area. Partnership stays steady at 11,000 uh, between last year and this year, and the lion's share of that, eight, eight of the 11,000, is goes to Pioneer Camp as part of our institutional relationship with Pioneer Camp. And we talk about Pioneer Camp, you hear about Pioneer Camp, if, you'll, if you haven't been to Pioneer Camp, you think, man, we talk about this place a lot, but actually it really does do an amazing job. Our youth, our, the kids here are very close friends with each other, and that is not in small part because they go to camp together. So it really is an important partnership and it means a lot to us and it's well worth $8,000 out of the budget. Um, about 2,000 of those dollars are um, the partners represent the partnership with Arasha, which is also a kind of key strategic uh, ministry partner of ours in the city. And then there, uh, we are open, so Pioneer Camp and Arasha are two sort of kindred ministries out there, parachurch ministries, and we are open to the possibility of other kindred ministries coming alongside. And so th this is another area where, at the moment, the lion's share is going to those two things, MPC and Arasha. We are open to other possibilities. Um, and Nathan Duick is has discussions underway with a couple of parishioners about potential possibilities down the road with this, uh, with partnerships. Uh, but at the moment, the lion's share goes to those two, MPC and Arasha. Uh, for community development, proportionately, this is a large increase, and really that's uh, coming back and more to where we were before last year. Um, we want to resurrect the newcomer's lunch to connect with as many people and families that we know who have started coming to St. Margaret's over the last couple of years, because we know that there are a lot of people that we see in new faces. We also want to set aside some funds for the non-newcomers who still come, who we know are also eager to meet at events that we've done in the past, like the barbecue and coffee and tea ministry, et cetera. So I'll leave it at that for community development. Buildings and grounds, this is going from uh, 40,000 uh, 40, last year to 43,400 this year, so about a $3,400 increase. And by buildings and grounds, what we don't mean is major capital projects. So major capital projects come out of capital funds. It's not really represented in the annual budget. The annual budget, buildings and grounds, it's sort of utilities, really basic maintenance, custodial, things like that. But let me just say that my dad is an was an architect, he just passed away last month, and he instilled in me <laughs> that as an owner of a building, your first, your first responsibility is to keep water out of it. The building envelope is what really matters. If you start having water coming into your building, that is irresponsible ownership. And so, um, so one of the things that we're going to have to do in owning a 100-year-old building is make sure that water is not seeping in through the brick or seeping in through the window frames. And so that is something that the Buildings and Grounds Committee is paying attention to, keeping the water out of the building fabric. Um, and some of that $43,000 is, is doing that kind of basic maintenance. Um, and the, the rise in the $3,400 rise 
in costs is mostly due to in, uh, rising insurance costs. That, that's, that is the lion's share of that increase, is increasing insurance. So for staff missioners, uh, this is all the staff who are more than part-time or 20 hours a week. As has been the case for many years, the staff missioners is the biggest line item in the budget. I don't really think I need to make too much of a pitch to all of you to convince you that we have a really incredible staff. This thoughtful, visionary, and high capacity team who are here to serve and empower each of the ministry areas. Just try to imagine this place for a second without the preaching, without the choir or the music, without the children's and youth ministries, without Lenten small groups. Pa <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> or evening lectures. It just would not be possible to imagine this loud place as we know it without our leaders. This year, this ministry area is also the one that increases the most. Graham already spoke to it earlier, but reviewing the budget presentation from last year, it's clear that already at that time, we were aware of a spike in the cost of living expenses due to inflation. Last year, the budget did not have the ability to match that spike, so the committee, with support from Vestry, made a goal to progressively increase wages in an effort to make sure that staff missioners are supported financially and not needing to worry about their day-to-day -day needs in a way that frees them to lead our growing congregation. So the increase to the staff missioners line item is really us remembering that increase in the cost of living last year. This is an effort to bring staff missioners wages into better alignment with that. All right, the <clears throat> diocesan uh, common ministry fund or the also called the apportionment, the diocesan apportionment. So this is the money that this congregation then sends to the diocese and the diocese has lots of expenses. The diocese has, a, has an entire administration. I mean, even if we were a congregational church, we would still belong to some sort of conference and there would be some sort of administration fee. And, uh, and then the diocese has its own ministries that it runs and it provides support to smaller congregations, smaller parishes that don't have the kind of support that we do. So, uh, so that is what that 40, oh sorry, last year it was 47,000, so this year is a $1,000 rise to $48,000. And we are committed to that number going up. So last year, even though the overall budget fell between 22 and 23, that line item we did not decrease last year. We kept it steady. And then this year, actually this increase, a $1,000 increase, is a modest increase. It's less than the overall size of the increase to the budget this year. Um, but we are committed to that number going up because this is actually important to support all the diocesan efforts. And um, sorry, I thought that I had one more thing to say about that. I'm consulting my notes, but uh, well, I think I will leave that there. Okay, that's, <laughs> sorry. I, <laughs> I'm drawing a slight blank. It's not, in, it's not represented in my notes. That's fine. I think that's okay. I, I can field questions about that if there are any. Okay. Uh, last is the mortgage. I don't have too much to say about the mortgage other than we're going to continue paying the mortgage. Um, but similarly to the, budget, to the governance and infrastructure item, this is part of that institutional part of the church. I mean, unless you comments. <laughs> yeah, the mortgage is largely for the, um, it's not the original mortgage for building the building, it's for the renovations to the basement from five-ish years ago. And uh, I think it was about $300,000 loan at the time, but it's down to less than, and now it's 200? Yeah, it's, now it's just under $200 left to pay out on that mortgage. Is there, sorry, Stu, is that right? Is that correct? Or, <laughs> it is $216,000. Okay. 
So there's $216,000 left to pay on the mortgage. Okay, so that, that's the budget. So now that we've presented the... Um, de oh, yes? So the diocesan apportionment, what the diocese asks for is 12% of the operating budget. And we are running significantly lower than that. We're running more like 8% at the moment. Um, yeah, so we are, we are not meeting what their expectations are at the moment. And that is something that the budget committee wrestled. Actually, it wrestles with it every year. And it wrestled with it again this year. And um, so the focus this year of the committee was to prioritize those cost of living increases for the staff team. And in effect, that priority sort of outranked in the, in the discussions, um, increasing this more than we did in the end. Now, I can, I can speak to that more again if you do have follow-up questions or uh, why, but yeah. It is a point of discussion. It is an ongoing point of discussion, for sure. Yeah, that we are, we are running underneath what the diocese would be wanting us to, um, to contribute. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what the pulling the plug, how that would go, but uh, Tom? My sense is that most parishes do not meet that 12% goal. Uh, I don't honestly, to, Tony is nodding yes, that that is correct. Is this okay that we're just keep, Chair, that we can take a few questions? It's fine, we're, these are all questions of clarification. I think we're still, this is appropriate. I, okay. If we start making proposals about changing numbers, I'm gonna push pause okay. <laughs> until we get to the motion, but I think this is all right. Okay, it's Ryan. Discussion. Yeah. And uh, it is a number that is proving difficult for most parishes to meet. Uh, and so this is an ongoing conversation diocese wide about what does that number need to be? It might be very well be a discussion in the Senate this year. What does this number need to be in order for parishes to support the, our common ministry in a way that we want to support it, um, while also keeping in mind that most churches' budgets are not where they were? Thank you, that's actually quite a, uh, so I don't know if everyone heard that, but the, so not every diocese calculates this number the same way. Like they, they need some sort of system, they need some sort of number, but different dioceses calculate that number according to a different formula. And the formula here is not just created by the bishop, it's actually created by synod. So it is, it is all the parishes put together that actually come up with that. I saw a hand over here, uh, Heather. Right. And therefore, we should be giving a proportionate share, at least, as Right. So our budget, so we are one of the, our budget, our overall budget is higher than almost any other parish in the diocese. Um, yeah, Harold. Yeah, Harold, so this is the, there's like, it's, it's off by $8,000 or something like that. Yes, okay, actually, so this is a complicated and boring accounting answer, but it, it, there, uh, we meant for insurance to be counted under buildings and grounds, but it kind of ended up coming out of governance. And so uh, that, that's basically, that's the, that's the short answer to what could be a longer answer. Okay. Um, okay, I think over back to you, Caleb, maybe. 
Okay, so now that we've presented some of the details of each ministry area, I think it's worthwhile to zoom out again and look back at the budget as a whole. Uh, to package this whole thing up in a very tight story, I'd go back to where we started, back in time to when the process started in fall. We were faced with these potentially competing interests. We saw a hard decision coming towards us. How can we remember and account for that spike in the cost of living that was not matched by the salary increases last year while also freeing our eager and ambitious leaders by giving them the resources that they needed to do that ministry? Then seemingly, wow, to our surprise, the overall increase in the estimate of giving driven by the commitment made by this parish on Consecration Sunday has actually made it possible for the committee to sidestep that tricky decision in a way, and we feel do a pretty good job at balancing both of those needs. So that's really all we have for like the formal presentation of the budget. I'd like to again thank you all for listening, and to Joanna, Chris, Heather, Stephen, uh, and also Ali Vidal for all of your contributions this year for preparing the budget. Thanks. All right. Thank you, uh, Graham and Caleb, for that presentation. Uh, I will just give one final call if there are any qu further questions for clarification while uh, Graham and Caleb are here. Okay, not seeing any. Uh, I would like to declare a five minute recess, not six minutes, five minute recess. A good time for a biology break or get a coffee or whatever you need to do. And we will reconvene at uh, 1.26 p.m. Thank you, see you in five minutes. Okay, so...
looking tired there, Holly. Good afternoon. I'd like to call the meeting to order again. We have reached uh, 126, actually 127. Our five minute break is over. Please return to your seats. Right, we are reconvening at exactly 1.28 p.m. for the minutes. Uh, I'd like to start this uh, section of our meeting uh, by inviting a motion to set a time of adjournment. So this is just to give us a goal that we could aim for in terms of our timing. Uh, it's around 1.30 right now. Uh, I would welcome a motion to set a uh, time of adjournment. Uh, Tom, what, is, what, what time do you wish? So we have an initial motion of uh, 2.30 p.m. as time of adjournment. Do I have a second? Uh, Ryan Turnbull, I see, is seconding that. Uh, any uh, proposed amendments or discussion around that motion? Looks like we're all comfortable with that. All right, all in favor of setting a time of adjournment for 2.30 p.m., please raise your hand. All opposed? The yeas have it. Carried. Thank you very much. Yeah, good, good point. For all those presenting from the front, if uh, a question is received from uh, the body, please repeat the question because you're microphone, right? And so then that way the people on YouTube can hear. I also see, and I neglected to say this in my initial uh, announcements, 
We do have a microphone set up in the center aisle, which can be used uh, for questions from the floor. So uh, please do make use of that technology. All right, where are we now? Presentation of 2003 financial statements. I'd like to invite uh, Stu to come forward and uh, tell us how we did. And Ali. <laughs> I'm really just sneaking up here to say two things and then I'll hand it all over to Stu. But I just want to say, first of all, as I'm involved with coming up with the estimate of giving each year, um, a thank you to uh, the, don the donors in our parish, which is you. And um, it just uh, it blows me away every year how faithful you are in your giving. And I don't think there are many churches that... Um, can see this growth year after year consistently, so I really do thank you for your faithfulness. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is just a big thank you to Stu. I did intend to um, do a little bit more this year in the role as assistant treasurer, and uh, I had a difficult year and was not able to, to step up as much as I'd like to, but um, Stu has put in uh, countless hours, and um, and has done a really good job at uh, systematizing the whole process. So thank you very much, Stu. Thanks, Ali. And uh, maybe I'll just continue the theme of thanks, just to start with. Um, and I do want to thank Ali as well um, for all of your work in uh, really helping us get our financials straight, and uh, particularly your amazing skills in, in forecasting, uh, which continue to be very much appreciated. Um, I also want to thank uh, Stan. Stan, I know you're out there. Um, Stan was our outgoing treasurer last year. Stan did a lot of work to uh, also on our, on our systems and just making sure we had everything straight, and also managed uh, a significant transition for us in this past year. So. I don't know if you remember from last year, um, if you're aware, we made the transition on to managing our own payroll in this past year, uh, which was a big move for us, um, but we were facing significant cost increases, um, sticking with payroll going through the diocese, and Stan did a lot of work working with the team here in the office to manage that, that transition um, to ensure that staff were still getting paid, which I think staff are also thankful for. So thank you, Stan, for that. Um, and also want to thank uh, Kristen, our envelope secretary, uh, who for many years has, has done this job and uh, does an amazing job just staying on top of all of the receding and making sure that we're also staying reconciled between what we have in our financial systems and, and what we are, are keeping track of. Um, and uh, also want to thank Mackenzie Taylor. You will have seen a note that uh, Mackenzie uh, stepped away in August from her role as parish administrator. And uh, so I want to thank Mackenzie uh, for all of the work that she did uh, on, our, on our financials. And also Jana as our incoming administrator, uh, who has been a very quick study uh, and has picked up a lot of pieces uh, in these last couple of months. So Jana, very much appreciate your work on this as well. I kind of feel like I'm like accepting an Oscar or something. <laughs> um, but, but there, there, there are, are lots of people to thank, and I hope that that's something that you note right off the bat, that there's a set of numbers here, but underneath those numbers, there's a lot of work that goes on just to ensure that you have those numbers. But also, I think the point that Caleb made earlier, um, that underneath these numbers are also stories, and I think that's what's actually really important. It's not the numbers themselves, but what those numbers represent uh, about what has happened in this past year, where we're going, the activities of the parish, and God's faithfulness. So as we go through these numbers, and I'll try and keep it as, as brief as I can, recognizing that this is the main reason you came back from your break, was just to hear this presentation. It's why they put it right after the break. Um, but uh, as, as we go through this, let's just keep our, our focus and our minds on what these numbers are telling us about the ministry of the parish, um, where we're going, and, and where we've been. So to start with, uh, and I know I didn't pay too much attention that this was gonna be printed in, in black and white on your, your thing, so like there's gray and there's gray. But so I will give you instead green and blue, and this just gives you a sense of what our offerings have looked like. I think one of the biggest stories of the past year was the big jump 
in our general offering this past year, for which we are exceedingly thankful. Um, as has already been alluded to, these are difficult times. Uh, we've been through a number of difficult years coming through COVID and now, of course, facing inflation and a lot of economic uncertainty. And for the Budget Committee, for the Vestry, I know that's been a lot of time of just thinking through and praying through what does this mean for us as a parish? Where are we going? And yet, in this past year, we've seen now uh, what I think I can safely say has been the highest year ever for St. Margaret's in terms of giving. Um, and I think this picture gives you a sense of recovery and moving above and beyond. The, the blue lines represent giving to our general offerings. So the budget that you looked at just before the break relates to that blue. The green is designated giving. So those are givings that are coming in specifically for particular projects that are outside of our general operating budget. Uh, and those funds carry forward and then are spent on specific projects. Um, and so you can see in this past year, um, we came in in the end uh, just under $585,000, um, which is something for which uh, we are thankful. Um, thankful to all of you uh, as parishioners and your generosity. Thankful to God for his faithfulness to this parish. Uh, and may we continue to honor that faithfulness in how we uh, carry forward with our ministry and our management of those resources. I don't expect you to be able to read this on the screen. This is more just saying this is what this report looks like. So hopefully you have it in front of you. Um, but our general uh, income statement, and again, you can see um, in terms of the, the key numbers that are there, uh, the general offerings uh, coming in, again, just under 585,000. That's a, over 11% over our uh, budgeted giving for the year. Um, just want to explain a couple of other numbers there. There's one that is called adjustments for designations. What that represents is that because the giving was so much higher than this past year, um, Vestry decided to put aside some of the funds from this past year into specific projects, and that amounted to $27,500. Um, and in the financial report, it goes into a little bit more detail on what those projects are. Um, we also have, it's a smaller number, but it might be one that's a bit of a head scratcher, previous year's adjustments and corrections uh, of $1,760. And those were just some funds. We have something that, um, as a charity, we're able to actually claim back half of the GST that we pay on expenses. So we keep track of that, and then periodically we make an application um, to get back those funds. And as we were going back through the old kind of GST receivable that we had accrued, found that there was uh, $1,760 that was actually sort of outside of the period that we can claim for. And so we will not be claiming for that. So we just had to uh, recognize that as kind of, kind of an expense. It wasn't cash going out the door, but it was cash we were expecting to receive in the future that we will not be. And then the detailed operating report essentially takes that big line of operating expenses on the general income statement and just breaks it out. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail on this because you've already actually just been looking at these numbers uh, as you were getting the budget presentation. The only thing that I do want to note is that you will see um, if you're really comparing what you've got in your um, uh, budget sheet and this report, there's a couple of differences. Graham just made reference to the fact that uh, insurance had gotten charged to governance and infrastructure when we normally put that in buildings and grounds. We had actually gone in and then made some corrections and adjustments. Um, so the overall numbers are the same, but you will see that the governance and infrastructure number now is lower than what you have in that budget presentation and the building and grounds numbers has gone up. Um, one other factor on the buildings and grounds as well, uh, and I think Graham also mentioned the insurance has gone up by about $2,000. Uh, our utilities were also up by about $2,000, I think just reflecting some of the in inflationary pressures. Um, given the weather that we're having, I'm not sure where we're gonna come in on utilities this year. Um, it has not been a really harsh year as yet for our heating costs and whatnot, um, but uh, just wanted you to be aware of uh, those uh, adjustments that have been made just in case you are looking at this and comparing with um, what you have in your in your other sheet um, and I'll just reiterate again uh, as was already also mentioned uh, 
total budget activities, we are about 17,000 above what we had budgeted. Um, but as was mentioned, the vestry had actually approved about a $25,000 further spend, um, recognizing again the financial position that we were in and wanting to make sure that those resources were being put to work right away for ministry. Um, because that decision came in, I think, November or December, um, there wasn't actually time to spend all of the $25,000, so we ended up about $17,000 above um, what we had originally set as our budget at our previous AGM. And uh, then I'll just note, uh, finally, uh, just a couple of trends in terms of fund balances. So uh, you do have in your report something called designated fund activity. Again, those are the funds that are outside of our uh, normal uh, operating or general operating budget for the year. Um, and so we have cash in our bank, but a certain amount of that cash is actually being held specifically for those particular uh, commitments that we have uh, to various ministries. Um, and so if we look back over the last few years, these green bars here represent that cash that's been set aside for designated funds. And then if we take the total cash that we have in our bank, we subtract out the amount that we already have set aside, that we've already basically said this is obligated to particular ministries. What we have left over is the funds that we have available for general activities. And if you look at this picture going back to 2020, you can actually see we were actually negative a couple of years ago on general activities, which meant we were essentially using funds that had been set aside for designated ministries just to fund our general operations. So if there was a case where suddenly every ministry needed those funds at the same time, we wouldn't actually have had the money in the bank to cover all of that. Um, and over the last couple of years, thankfully, we've been able to move into a position where our general operating is also in a positive, um, a positive space. So as of this last year, we had, uh, as of December 31st, we had just a bit shy of $229,000 that was set aside for specific ministries. Um, but we also had uh, just shy of $37,000 that was available for our general activities. So that's available to put toward that, that operating, operating budget. And then the gray bars just give you a sense of uh, the mortgage was already mentioned uh, and where our mortgage sits. Uh, as of December 31st, it was at $216,622. Uh, and as mentioned, that's paying for past projects that were not uh, fully funded. Um, and so that, that mortgage um, is coming up in January of 2027. So thankfully we had renewed just before interest rates uh, really went up um, and uh, still have that, that mortgage locked in for another, another couple of years at least. Uh, and that's at 3.72%. Uh, so that's looking like a pretty decent interest rate uh, at, at today's rate. So we're thankful for that as well. Um, yeah, and so all of those numbers you can see in the balance sheet if you want to go down into a little bit more detail. Um, and on the following sheet, then, just give the calculation we've been looking at for the last couple of years for the vestry, which is those funds available for general activities. So when we take the money that's in the bank and then we subtract out all the stuff that we owe to other people or organizations and the money we have set aside for uh, those designated ministries, that's what we have available for our, for our general, general ministry. So I think really the, the take home message at this point is one, tremendous thankfulness for the giving over the last year um, and also uh, gratitude for uh, the position that we're in now where we are in a positive position with our general operating fund uh, and we are also able to sustain, um, you know, really that's representing a quarter million dollars worth uh, of, of cash designated to, to ministry. Um, so hopefully that is helpful. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, yeah. We'll open the floor for questions. No, thank you so much, Stu. That was a great presentation. Are there any questions for Stu on anything that's been presented related to our 2023 financial picture?
So the question is whether we were able to determine the sources of the increase in income. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else can speak to that in any more detail. I don't have a lot of insight into it, except to say that when we looked at the giving patterns, um, nine of the 12 months last year were right around what we expected. So if we took the budgeted giving for the year and then we, we have a sense from past years how much percentage to expect in each month, about nine of those months were right on and then three of those months were unusually high. Uh, and so it wasn't like a sustained sort of 11% increase month by month, but rather there were some, some larger gifts that did come in through the year. Eric? So the question is, what percentage has switched to automated giving? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know. I'm looking at Kristen or Ali. Yeah, so just, just to summarize for those online, um, Eric is just asking uh, what is the percentage of automated giving? Has that gone up with the expectation that would, we would expect that to kind of smooth our giving rather than seeing spikes when suddenly somebody remembers that they didn't put their offering in last month. Um, so yeah, the bottom line is I think we, we believe that's kind of increasing over time, but I don't think we have any figure. I'm looking back. Ali, do we have any? No. Yeah, so Ali was just saying that uh, all our online giving is not necessarily all monthly giving, but there are a number of one-time gifts still being received online as well. So that could still make things a little, little spiky. Yeah, Dave. So the question, do we know which months we do? Can I remember off the top of my head which months they were? Not quite. Um, it was April, April July. July, and I think like it was earlier. It was February or March, okay. I think. Um, so I mean, it's like around April, you're thinking maybe Easter, um, you know. Um, July. Somebody was at the cottage and then thought, oh my goodness, I didn't do my offering for the first half of the year. I better send that all in right now. Good thing I can do it online. Um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, I, I do remember looking at it before and thinking, you know, there was the obvious like Easter kind of thing, but for a couple of the others, it wasn't, wasn't immediately obvious. Are there any more questions regarding the 2003 financial uh, presentation? All right, seeing none, the, that presentation will be received for information, and let's give a round of applause to Stu. So every year at our AGMs, we do try to feature a uh, spotlight on a particular ministry report, and this year it is Skate Life Canada. So I'd like to invite uh, Caleb and Bonnie to make a presentation on Skate Life Canada. Skate Life East, sorry. Got it. 
Um, I am acutely aware, <coughs> excuse me, uh, at every annual general meeting that our, while our operating budget um, captures a large percentage of the ministry that this congregation accomplishes, it does not capture 100% of it. Uh, partly I'm acutely aware of that because of all of the stories I get to hear from you and your lives and the ways that you minister to those around you. But I'm also acutely aware because I live with somebody who is constantly in the work of ministry and it is not captured in our operating budget. And that is my husband, Caleb, Caleb Elias. Um, so Caleb is going to tell us about Skate Life East and we thought it, it would be fun for me to interview him. But we'll, I guess we'll see on that one. Okay, um, Caleb. Tell us what Skate Life is and how big is it? Yeah, so Skate Life is um, it's a, it's a program under Young Life of Canada. And so Young Life is, over, is throughout the states and mostly in Western Canada. But Skate Life actually spans from BC to Quebec. And I look after Montreal, Ontario, and Quebec as the Skate Life East side of Skate Life Canada. And um, we make up eight staff two female, six male, and we have about 60 volunteers and we run 16 clubs through Canada. Impressive. <laughs> um, <I didn't> know. <laughs> um, okay, um, now this is a question I think about quite a lot. Why, why skaters? Why skateboarding? Why skateboarders? Well, I was a skateboarder, but um, skateboarding, skateboarding doesn't lend itself to the same type of mentors and coaches that basketball or hockey does, in that there's just not regular adults um, encouraging and supporting. I'll just keep, I just have a bunch of photos, so look at this cute kid. Um, th th this guy, if he was a hockey player, he'd have a great coach to encourage him along, but um, with skateboarding, he, uh, th th he does find, you would find camaraderie in skateboarding, but you don't necessarily find a coach. And so that's where Skate Life kind of slides in and is going to spend time with him every week at a skate club and take him to skateboard camp and um, walk with them and get to know them. So I was that kid, I was a skateboarder, and, kid, and mentors came along beside me and said, hey, how about, uh, how about make thinking before you act? <laughs> <laughs> Still working on that one. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Kidding. Um, okay. Great. Oh, another photo. Excellent. Okay. Tell us, Caleb, about your day to day. What do you work on um, in the middle of the week? What are you doing? Another reason, question that Fab Bonnie doesn't know the answer to. <laughs> what do you do? Uh, no. So I, I wear kind of. I wear three hats. Um, I have an, an administrative role. Like I look after this eastern part of Canada. So we plan skate camps. We do fundraisers. Um, I'm painfully writing out, trying to write green team grants right now. But so that's the least passionate side. And then coming more to the center, I would say I really love the leadership development that I do. I supervise staff in Ontario and Quebec and just our volunteers here in Manitoba. And I love doing that work. And then I'd say the third hat that I wear is just being a pastor to skateboarders. I'm just kind of out there. I'm at the skate shop. I'm at the skate park um, in the streets. This is why this photo's here. This is uh, in Montreal, and we just go skate this spot. These bumps are really fun to skate. And so we just go and hang out at the skate park, or in the streets, and um, we, we care about kids. We pastor them. Awesome. Is that where you do a salad grind? No. That's an that's a inside joke, because salad grind is a very uncool skate trick. Now you know that. OK, um, now I know very well that there's no skateboarding in the snow. So can you tell us about what your summers look like and what's the sort of high point? Yeah, summer is the pinnacle. Everything kind of goes towards summer. All the clubs kind of build up towards it. So we take kids on a skate trip, which we used to call road rage. This is from the summer. Um, this kid just broke his leg, and this kid just hurt his wrist. And this my one of my volunteers, Brad. And so um, this was our crew this summer and we, we take kids on skate camp. And so we've catered to skate camp that is for skateboarders. It like resembles this experience of if you were a pro skater, we get in a van, we drive um, to Montreal or to BC, and we give them this experience. And we meet up with a bunch of other skate clubs and we make it the week of their life. Like we make it the best. And so we often hear kids say, that was the best week of my life. So that was this ha happening here. 
He's not joking that that guy with one shoe actually just broke his ankle. Like, they put him in the van, and then they went to the hospital after that <laughs> uh, story. Which um, brings me to saying I often get to hear lots of the stories after ski camp. Some of them make me feel terrified, and some of them make me feel like, wow, that's awesome. Can you give us one of the awesome, maybe? Yeah, with, with this group, not this group, but the one before, um, this was in Montreal, but um, the group in, the group in, Win in with Winnipeg, um, that was a really hard year. So, so sometimes it's like, oh, that was so fun. We just like drove around and skateboarded and got to tell kids about how much God loves them. This year, these kids fought the whole time, like the whole time. And, and these, at one point, these friends um, got into an altercation, a little bit of a fist fight. And so we were actually trying to do some conflict resolution of you do need to get into the back into the van because we're in Revelstoke, BC, and we have a long way to go. So... <laughs> come back into the van, we're going to make things right, we're going to do apologies, and, and so those are the harder stories, but actually, they, are, they do have bright sides, because we teach these kids about, you know, saying sorry and making things right, and uh, I think the fun story Bonnie likes to bring up is, very often we take kids that have, out of the province, that have never left Winnipeg, or the province, and we've done things like take them on the Maid of the Mist in Niagara Falls, which is the boat that goes in, and, and the, I, there's these tough, tough Winnipeg kids that are like, I can't wait to tell my granny about this. <laughs> it's pretty special. So sweet. Okay, um, final question. What does skate life need in Winnipeg? What are you looking for working on right now? Yeah, one of, one of our big needs is that we don't have a spot indoors here, so um, if anyone has a contact that uh, they could help me. We need something like a gym, just so we can meet throughout the winter. Because um, so, right now we're just doing things grassroots, and but we'd love to have a club. So if you have any leads on that, I would love some help. And um, and if anybody wants to get more involved on a regular basis, we also I'm also developing just a committee of people that can meet with me on a regular basis. And the last thing is yes. You need a skate park or just like a gym, like like um, we just need. Yeah, like not the sanctuary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like a like a like sometimes some churches have basement gyms, but it doesn't have to be a church. It could be a hangar or a I don't know. It could be anything. So most of the skate clubs are like this is a good example. This is like a church basement in Montreal, and and the church lets them skate there, but it has to be the right kind of decrepit and the and you can't you know you don't want to like wreck anything that's really beautiful. Um, this, is a, this is another example of a gym that was in Toronto um, on Pape Street where um, it's a club that I started there 10 years ago. And so um, the last need is that, is that Don Betts and I are planning a Grand Fondo fundraiser in September and I, guys like Caleb are coming. And so if you want to do a Grand Fondo, which means a long bike ride or support our Grand Fondo with some fundraising, then you can hop on board or bike on board. Great. That's all. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Caleb, for that uh, presentation. Uh, just while you're here, are there any questions for Caleb while we got him here about uh, skate life? Yeah, great question. Are the, what, the question is, what are, is the demographic of the skateboarders we work with? And Skate Life does have um, three different programs. So one is called Boarding School, and that is working with like young kids, or we call it skate punks now, and that's working with young kids. And then we have just our skate clubs, and that's teenagers, 12 to 17, 18, 19. But we also work with late adolescents because we're noticing a trend of lots of young adults needing just somewhere to go, some, somewhere to connect and belong, and then we call that creaky bones. So, <laughs> so we work with the, oh, we have all, all those groups. I'm uh, in the beyond creaky bones. <laughs> I don't know what we call that. Um, any other questions? I should say thank you. Um, Bonnie mentioned that the, the, the parish does not, or parish does not give to me directly, but actually many, but the church does. I get many, many donations um, from the congregation, so I can't do it without this community. So, big thumbs up. <laughs> oh, there is a, a question. Oh, Scott? Yeah. How, do you, how do you connect with kids? How do you like, outreach to get them involved with skating? Yeah, 
Yeah, Scott asked if um, <laughs> how we connect with kids in an outreach way. So the Skate Life model is um, these, it's called the four C's. And so first we just do contact work. Uh, that's a lot of what we're doing now in Winnipeg. We're just out there, um, kind of grassroots, just connecting with kids on a basic level. But then we invite them to a skate club. So it's first kind of being on their turf and then it invites, then it, we invite them into a skate park setting. And at that point we will do a talk, like a club talk. And it'll have like a game as, as well. And then some sort of like talk about highs and lows and we'll present an idea and have a conversation with them. And then at skate camp, it's, it's certainly like, we'll offer them like the Christian story and um, then, so, so, so it's um, contact, um, camp, and club. Club and camp, those are the main ones. And church, church gets in there at the end. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, let's thank give you, thank Caleb you. a round of applause. <laughs> All right, next order of business is to receive the reports as printed in the circular. I would entertain a motion to receive these reports as printed. All right, uh, looks like Harold there. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Uh, Holly, I got you there. Great. So uh, the motion is on the floor. Are there any comments, questions, or amendments to that motion? Yes, we have one. <laughs> I'll step up here. I have an amendment and a comment. Which would you like first? Um, let's do the amendment first. Okay. Um, as a member of the Chancel Guild, I would like to make an amendment to the Chancel Guild report, and that is to add the names of those currently serving. And I could read them out or just hand them to you. Well, Secretary, what would you prefer? Um, probably they could hand them to you. Okay, I'll do that when I'm finished. You know, actually, I'm going to, let's read them out so everyone read them out? is aware. Yes. Yeah, just, okay. yeah, because it is an amendment, yeah. Okay. Um, Marion Firth, uh, Carolyn Oshaway, Ryan Stowes, Amalia Zerzolo, and sometimes her children, Clara Sophia and Sebastiano, who regularly come and help and learn, uh, and myself, Karen Bowler. Okay, great. So we have a proposed amendment. Now, as chair, I'm going to characterize this as a friendly amendment, which is a thing in Robert's Rules, right? Which means we don't necessarily have to go to full vote if the original, the maker of the original motion agrees with the amendment. So Harold, I'm looking to you, I got a thumbs up. Harold does agree with this amendment, so that does classify it as a friendly, not hostile <laughs> amendment. So we can deal with this uh, uh, as a, a kind of a consensus basis. So uh, we will assume consensus, but I will now ask, is anyone opposed to this friendly amendment to the motion? Looking once, looking twice, looking three times, we are going to make an, uh, an assumption that there is consensus approval for this amendment. Now, we go back to the original motion. Uh, so that's carried. The amendment is carried, right? Now we go back to the original motion as amended. But before we do that, we were going to talk about comments. And I believe Karen had a comment. <laughs> yes, I would just like to extend an invitation to anyone who would like to join our happy band uh, we have various kinds of tasks involved. There is a lot of learning. When I first joined, uh, Bonnie gave a talk on the symbolism and beauty of the work at the altar. Um, there are tasks running around sometimes, uh, things to do to pick up boughs, to affix them, to put the daffodils on. Um, the first time I saw uh, Marion explain how to set up at the high altar. There, were, there was Carla, there was Amalia, and there was Clara Sophia. And she was standing there taking in all the details, and she asked a question when Marion invited a question, and she said, am I the youngest person ever to do this job? <laughs> and it's so lovely. If you would come here on a Saturday afternoon, you would you would perhaps find um, 
Amalia and Clara Sophia thinking about the details and busily setting things up and understanding some of the mystery and the beauty of it, it is, it is worship. And so I invite you to think about what part you would like to, to play. We try to cover all the, the church years so you can you know, zip in when you're in town, you can talk to us, you can think about what, what that might involve, uh, might be in, involved. So we just invite you into this beauty that we are experiencing together. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Karen. All right, we have a motion on the floor to, uh, uh, oh, we are, our, our, our uh, originator of the motion yeah. is now willing to take can, the floor, can I, please. Can I, just, can I just say a word? I, whenever I read the, the annual reports, and this happens with me every year, I get moved. I, I am so grateful for the people um, who have written those reports, but even more for the people who have been here throughout the year and who are represented in those reports. And I just want to say from, from a, a deep and heartfelt thank you to all of those people uh, who are involved in ministry at St. Margaret's. Um, thank you especially for the, for the leaders of the ministries who have written the reports and, and who, are, who are providing that to us uh, who aren't in, as involved in those particular ministries. But I just want to say a really deep thank you to all those people, and I'm sure I speak for many people here. Thanks. Thank you. Well said. Are there any other comments, questions, or amendments to the motion regarding the, the receipt of the reports as circulated and now amended? Eric. So I couldn't hear? Right, yeah, the motion is to receive the reports as printed in the circular. Simple as that. The amendment added specific names related to a particular ministry, right? The Chancellor Guild, and I think uh, Jana will have that written. It was, it was spoken from the microphone. So that's the only amendment, is adding the names of the participants to the chancel. Any other questions, comments, or amendments on this motion? All right, if not, we will uh, put it to a vote. All in favor uh, of receiving the reports as printed in the circular as amended, please raise your hand. All opposed, please raise your hand. The yeas have it, carried. We now come again to the 2024 budget. Uh, and I believe Caleb uh, would like to make a motion to approve the budget as proposed. I so move. I so move. Do we have a seconder? Uh, I s oh, yes, sir. Yeah, Doug. Okay, Doug seconds. Great. The motion is now on the floor. Uh, are there any uh, amendments? comments or questions regarding the 2024 budget. I see Larry, go ahead. My question is to the leadership about, so we have a, obviously a large untapped pool of giving, like 25% above, which is going to designated funds. My question to the leadership is, if that money came to you for ministry, what would you do with it? So that's my first question, my, am I allowed a second? My second question is, should we reverse what we're doing? And that's, we should present a vision and ask people what their commitment is, rather than say, what can you give? And let's let that drive ministry. Thank you for your question, Larry. Um, I think that given the amount of giving that um, we have been given, um, what I would do with it is what we are doing. <clears throat> that is, we would continue to grow a church that is investing in young people. We would continue to invest in the community around us, and we would continue to look for the ways that God is calling us to minister to the world around us. The reason that we um, <clears throat> set the budget beginning with the stewardship ministry is because of principles that we were taught by many of the pillars of this congregation many, many years ago, uh, who believed and have taught us that when we ask the congregation to give according to what they feel led to give, 
that as is actually what ends up driving the ministry and the vision of a whole congregation that the whole congregation has necessarily all already bought into together. So that's the reason why we continue to um, approach our budget in this way uh, and continue to um, first refer to our stewardship ministry before, before um, presenting the congregation with um, a budget. Uh, the danger in doing the opposite, I think, is that congregations begin to feel as though they're being uh, given a bill by their church leadership that they have to then um, sort of pony up for by the end of the year. Uh, we want to reverse that direction. I think that we are seeing in some other places that uh, the opposite doesn't necessarily lead to growth in congregations, while what St. Margaret's has seen, and uh, thanks um, to the leadership of um, Sid Kerwin, and Barbara Andres, Bruce Hanford, and Linda Parsons so many years ago is that when people are asked to give according to what they feel led to give, God will give through them. Thank you, Bonnie, and thank you, Larry, for the question. Are there any other comments, questions, proposals? Ryan. Uh, I, I have a question. Um, we start these business meetings with the land acknowledgement, and I didn't see anything in our budget having anything to do with Indigenous ministries, and I know that's part of something that the, the diocese does, uh, so maybe that's one of the ways you think about that, but I was just wondering if that comes up in budget discussions and what the parish is thinking about that. Yeah, that would probably fall under a kind of partnerships, um, and we are open to partnership ideas, and so that I think is probably the short answer to that. Um, yeah. All right. Any other comments, questions, proposed amendments on the 2024 budget? All right, seeing now we do, uh, seeing none rather, we do have a motion to approve the budget for 2024 as proposed. We do have a second on that. Are we ready to vote? All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, please raise your hand. We do register one opposition. However, the yeas have it. Carried. We turn now to the matters of other business, uh, and we can now announce the um, election results for Synod delegates for 2024. We have four Synod delegates elected. I will read them in alphabetical order. Synod delegates for 2024 are Tracy Curl, Paul Dick, Sam, Pam Friesen, and Colton Koval. Alternates in alphabetical order for 2024 Synod will be Sabina Fazaludin, Jana Neufeld, Caleb Olfert, and Nathan Rempel. Let's congratulate. Now we turn uh, to new business. We do have one item of new business that was handed to me during the break. Uh, I'll read it verbatim. While we're all here, what's the status of having a parish directory? Many would find it helpful for connecting with other parishioners. Bonnie, would you like to respond? Great question. Uh, we do have a parish directory. We don't have a super high rate of compliance in this congregation. I don't know. We have a, like a very high rate of giving and generosity, but not a super high rate of people that fill in forms and return them to us. So uh, the undertaking of a directory is year by year uh, something that we do try to get to. Um, we have the last uh, iteration of it was produced in 2021. 22? 21 or 22? 21? 
And um, so, yep, that's something that we'll undertake to do again in this year. Uh, so stay tuned in the um, bulletin for more announcements and those forms. And then you could give them back to us, and then we'll really have a, have a directory. All right, thank you. That uh, concludes uh, our new business. And we now go into our closing items. Uh, and that will begin with closing remarks from Bonnie. Very briefly, I just want to um, remind everyone that this uh, Tuesday is our Shrove Tuesday Pancake, Su Pancake Supper. It's going to take place at First Presbyterian Church just up the street. It's just across the street from Vimuridge Park. Uh, Nate Rempel and his crew from Manitoba Pioneer Camp will be cooking once again. It is sure to be a very fun time. Um, they'll be there from 5 to 7 cooking pancakes. It's $5 for an individual, $20 for a family. Please do um, make your way down there. Don't come here. There are no pancakes here. Nobody's going to have a pancake in this building. <laughs> Uh, and then come the next day for our Ash Wednesday service, uh, tell your friends. We'll send out a little electronic uh, poster for you to pass around to those you might want to invite in the uh, tomorrow, and, then, um, and you'll see them up around the uh, neighborhood. So please do also spread the word for that service. Great. Uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn at uh, 2.16 p.m. Would anyone like to make that? Oh, Jack, first up. <laughs> Now, I believe a motion to adjourn does not require a second. Any opposed to adjourning? You no, know, no brave soul would be, okay. Uh, in that case, I do declare this meeting adjourned at 2.16 p.m. Thank you so much for your participation. Uh, I think it'd be appropriate to close with a hymn. Uh, is Lowell here be willing to lead us uh, in a hymn? Please come forward. We're going to sing Jesus Shall Reign, number 164. Let's pray together the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Clint. All done. Thank you. throughout the entire event.